right, uh, our next speaker is Ben Monte from Caltech, and he's going to tell us about his uh, catalog for transit timing posteriors. Uh, yeah, uh, so thanks for having me. Uh, this is work that I have done with Juliet Becker, uh, who's now a grad student in Michigan. She's emerging in her own right, despite the fact that she's not here. Uh, and John Johnson, who has emerged at this point, uh, <laughs> <laughs> featured in the last three talks. Uh, so I know many of you, I don't know all of you, uh, so hi there, uh, those of you I don't. Uh, I'm Ben, I'm a grad student. Uh, I'm not going to talk about a couple projects, uh, but I would love to talk to you. This is kind of just going on itself. Oh, it is. Yeah, should I uh, be concerned about that? <laughs> uh, <laughs> use the what if I just unplug it? Is that oh, okay. All right. Uh, so there are things I would love to talk to you about while I'm here if you want to, uh, including uh, this paper I just wrote. We're doing some follow-up stuff. Nope, still going. All right. Um, <laughs> So I wrote this paper about uh, transiting uh, brown dwarf in the Kepler field, transiting an M dwarf. Uh, it's really low radiation. It's really interesting. I think uh, I love jets. I've got this project where we're looking at young M dwarfs in binaries, similar to what Inchikalis talk, talked about yesterday. Uh, slightly older M dwarfs uh, to look at um, uh, to measure dynamical masses. Love to share with you about any of those. But today I'm going to talk about transit timing variations, and that time I meant to click. Uh, and so, uh, Daniel yesterday gave a great intro to TTVs. Uh, Megan Shaver has a poster back there. Uh, but in general, uh, if you have a star with one planet around it, you'd see uh, this planet transiting completely periodically, once per orbit, at exactly the same time. Uh, if you had multiple ones, you have dynamical interactions between the two of them. Uh, every time they pass near each other. Uh, uh, one will come a little early, one will come a little late. Um, and then you will see this in Kepler data and can infer the presence of another planet uh, or measure its parameters. If the planet's more massive, uh, maybe you have a bigger signal. Uh, so in general, the key takeaway is that, and I hope you can see this in the back, uh, transit timing can tell us primarily about eccentricities of exoplanets, inclinations, and their masses, or at least the mass ratio, mass of the planet over mass of the star. Uh, and so they're really important because none of these are the things we think about uh, when we think about Kepler data. We think about measuring radii, or radii ratios. Uh, so TTVs give us an opportunity to measure some of these other parameters that are awfully hard to, me to measure. Uh, and so when we see TTV data in the literature, it's usually presented like this. Uh, you'll see these points, each one is one transit, uh, and then this is some deviation from the completely linear model. Uh, maybe higher up is a little late, lower is a little bit early. Uh, and so if, if you're not that great at drawing a spline in Keynote, uh, you draw it kind of like this, uh, you get this vaguely sinusoidal feature going on. Uh, and it more or less follows a sinusoid, with the exception of a couple points here. Some stuff is weird. There's this one that's oddly low. Uh, there's a couple others that are kind of weird. And so maybe that's real, but maybe that's just a problem with the analysis. Uh, and if you're really quick at reading, you just saw that this is because some of the current best practices aren't perfect. Uh, often uh, Gaussian errors are assumed. You notice all of these are you know, symmetric error bars is just point error bar. That's all you get. Uh, so if you want to use this data, you have to assume Gaussian errors. Uh, white noise is assumed in calculating all of these. It's generally good with Kepler data. It's not perfect. Uh, certainly not for these slightly evolved stars. Uh, it ignores uh, ill-fitting transits. Uh, this, if there's something that doesn't fit great, they just throw it out. Uh, short cadence data is generally ignored. Uh, and Generally, there's not a marginalization over transit shape. Uh, and so sometimes this doesn't matter. If you have a transit that looks like this, uh, that's a pretty easy to spot transit, right? The, the time of transit, it's right here. 
Um, and so, um, you know, you, you have to do a lot to really mess this one up. But what about this? Where's the transit? Uh, it's, oof, right in that data gap. Kepler wasn't perfect. There's gaps in the data. If a transit falls in there, and generally it's thrown out, but really you have some information. It's not there, it's not there. It's somewhere in the middle, kind of uniform probability. Uh, and then the transit shape matters. Here's another one where there's a missing point there. We know right where uh, ingress is, where the planet starts going into transit. We don't know where egress is when it comes out. And so if you don't understand the shape, uh, you know, you'll mess up the time of transit for this. Uh, and so then also correlated noise matters. Uh, so uh, we need to uh, either quantify if there is not just white noise, we want to be able to quantify that, uh, and then we want to be able to use that information in our time to transit. Uh, without using that, if you assume white noise and there is red noise, you'll underestimate your error bars on all of these. Uh, the good news is we have a lot of data. We know what the star is doing because Kepler looked at all these for four years. Uh, and so there's lots of observations uh, of the star when there's not a transit going on. So you know exactly what's going on with the star. And so here are just four, let's say pseudo-random, they're all 10 days apart, uh, times of observation of one star in the Kepler data. Uh, and then you can see the, um, the data and then some visualization of what the correlated noise structure looks like. Uh, and so blue is more correlated, red is more anti-correlated. Uh, this is similar to a plot that uh, Chikala showed yesterday. But if you do this many times, uh, you can then infer the average covariance structure for the star and then use that in an analysis. Uh, so once we have that, might as well use it. And we can then build not just times of transit, but transit timing posterior distributions for every transit in Kepler. Uh, so we fit some models, uh, um, fit time to transit, measure a likelihood, do this many times, figure out what the distribution of transit times look like. Uh, and so for this we use a technique called important sampling, uh, and this is a technique to kind of efficiently measure these posteriors. Uh, so this might be what a posterior looks like. And really, whenever you are doing some analysis here uh, to measure a likelihood function, you're going to fit a model with various parameters. Uh, and so in this case, you'd fit a transit model at many different times and measure the likelihood. No matter what you're doing in MCMC, uh, whatever you're doing, it's some variation on this theme. Uh, measure a likelihood at many times. And so a really easy but inefficient way to do this uh, would be to uh, just do effectively a grid search and then just take every single time, fit a transit model there and measure the likelihood. But that means you are wasting a lot of time measuring transits that are... Yeah, so you're going to spend a lot of time fitting way over here and a lot of time fitting way over here where there's really low likelihood. So you're just spending a lot of time wasting computer cycles. Um, so instead, since we know vaguely where the transits are going to be, planets are nearly periodic, uh, we can uh, uh, optimize our search. We know it's going to be here-ish, so let's search here-ish. Uh, and if you do this, then your, most of your search is at a point where it's useful, and then you know how often you search there, so you can figure out what the true likelihood is based off of what the likelihood you measure is and how many times you search in that area. Uh, and so we do this for every transit, and I apologize for the really garish color scheme here, uh, but we can build these effectively river plots, which are similar to what you've seen uh, for transit times before, uh, where you might have seen this, where you have flux here, and you can see the transits moving through. Uh, but this is actually the probability distribution moving through. So there's points of high probability happening earlier and later and earlier again. And there's some gaps where there's just missing data where maybe Kepler wasn't looking at the star for a quarter. Um, and so I was going to write up this scheme in a tweet. It's very easy, uh, but Robert Moore had beat me to it. Uh, and so here it is. Uh, 
very simple. <laughs> and so important sampling has some pros and cons. It's really parallelizable, right? No sample depends on any other sample. Uh, it's fast enough. We get all our posteriors for free. It's simple, see? Uh, the cons are you need to know where to sample. Uh, but that's not really a con for Kepler. We know where the planets are vaguely. And it's, I said fast enough, but that assumes that you have a fast computer. Uh, so we're in the process of doing all of this. We're doing all the singly transiting systems and then following a couple interesting ones up with RVs. The multis are coming up next. Uh, we'll put everything online at the end. Uh, and so if you want to use our samples directly, you can use that. If you want to use our river plots, uh, you know, whatever is more efficient for you. Uh, and then if you have systems you're really excited about, uh, we'll run them first. Uh, and also, we don't have a name for this project yet. You'll notice this is boring. Uh, so if you have a you know fun name, there's space in the acknowledgments for you. Uh, and thank you. Questions? Uh, what's what's the difference between important yeah important sampling and basically a prime? Uh, so. Having a prior would mean then you will, so there's a little bit of a similarity in that if you are, you're only going to search in the area where you put down your important sampling distribution. So if there's something going on somewhere else, you will miss it. But it doesn't actually go into, like the shape that I decided on here does not go into the final likelihood. At the end, we divide out the, like, the shape of that function okay. so that a small sample over here, you know, a region of high likelihood, even if it's unlikely that we find it over there, uh, will influence significantly the results. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, how do you figure if your uh, important sampling has converged yet? Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> uh, so, um, a little bit. Uh, the in, in general, um, you know, we know for the high signal to noise cases what the transit shape is going to look like, and so when those look like what they should, you you have the idea that you might have done it enough. Uh, in general, I mean, I don't know if there's a robust statistic to prove that it's converged. So we've just done the strategy of uh, extreme overkill. Uh, but is there like a dependence, I guess, then on like this, the strength of your signal and how many important samples you're certainly <laughs> uh, and certainly then you know the width of your signal that if you need a sample wide enough to measure your whole distribution. Okay. Need one more. Yeah. What do your time series look like? Do they look Multimodal, a lot of the time, do they look non Gaussian but symmetric? So it depends on the planet. Uh, you know, high signal to noise stuff, if it's a hot Jupiter, they just all look great, right? Uh, if it's uh, a low signal to noise thing uh, and there's a lot of correlated noise in the star, you do see a lot of multimodal action. Uh, you'll see some, some asymmetric features, not as much as the multimodal things that you'll see. Uh, then when you have two transits near each other, like nearly overlapping transits, then you'll get some power in each. Uh, the most common things are in the low signal to noise things where, you know, some of these one and a half Earth radius things where they're just not very deep transits in any individual one and you can't really see it by eye. You just, you know, you get a little bit of power where you expect it and then you get kind of these other tails on the side. Uh, so those are the most interesting cases. Anything, a Neptune it doesn't really change a lot. A Jupiter doesn't change a lot. Um, actually, that's it for questions for now. We can talk with them. I'll be here all night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>